getting ready for a week before uh, Thanksgiving. We are in that week, Sunday being the first day of the week, not the week end. Saturday is the week end. Sunday is the week beginning, as I harp on all the time. <laughs> Good way to start off the week in the house of the Lord. If we want to call it that. It's the place where the Lord ordained, at least that we should ordain, meet somewhere, and this is where we meet for our uh, our uh, squad or our platoon or whatever you want to call it. If you want to go with the theme of our song, The Banner of the Cross, and to our lesson this morning. But we're here to learn and to grow, and again, it's good to see you today. I'm going to ask you once again to t- turn to the book of Genesis as we continue in our series, Creation and, and Evolution Investigated. Creation and Evolution Investigated. Obviously, this is not an exhaustive study. And you can be pointed to many good books uh, that uh, delve into this, giving you the points of view. Uh, we were taught the point of view either in high school or grade school or uh, college for some, but uh, many are not taught the biblical perspective of uh, the Genesis uh, account. And there are various takes on the Genesis account, but it's important that we who call ourselves born-again Christians, first of all, that we know that we're saved, and secondly, that we have an interest in the work and the Word of our Savior. I'm afraid that there are a lot of Christians who have an interest in the work of our Savior on the cross, and that's where they leave Him. They will receive Him as Savior, but when it comes to the study of the Word, it seems like there's a, there's a lack of uh, something. I'm not sure what. But anyway, we looked at this. And with last week, we looked at the earth being restored, at least Wednesday, which was last week. We looked at the earth as it is being restored. And we went to the second part of Genesis chapter 1 and verse 2, where it says, And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of of the waters. And I'm not going to go through that whole lesson again because there's a whole lot there. But you can check out the uh, YouTube video or the church website and uh, that's fine. Or I can email you the hard notes on that. And uh, I'll be glad to do that. So, we're going to look at the first three days of the six days of creation as our primary study this morning. So, why wait? Again, and the earth in the beginning, in eternity past, God created out of non-existent materials the heavens and the earth. But the earth had become without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the frozen deep. And then the Spirit of God moved upon the surface of the waters and down to the bottoms of the waters, the deep places of the waters, and began a restoration. And then God said, Let there be light. And there was light. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Let's pray. Father, we ask as we go into the Word this morning, You'll bless the Word as we try to understand it, as we study it, as we come to understand You more and more. Help us to understand the importance of learning truth without distraction as much as possible so that we can focus on the message at hand and the lesson at hand, the teaching at hand, the doctrine at hand, so that in turn uh, we can understand Your point of view. Not to make us smarty pants, because we know that just gets us in trouble, Lord, but to understand your point of view. Father, we realize that we cannot be ambassadors for you if we don't know you and your word. So thank you for the opportunity to learn today. And thank you for those who come out and can make it out, or those who can listen by way of the Internet, so that they can grow some more in the grace and knowledge of Jesus Christ. For it's in his name we pray and give thanks. Amen. I said something uh, Wednesday I'll repeat this morning, and y'all have heard it, but maybe some didn't. 
I know you all did. But as I said Wednesday, and I'll say it again, a little thing that came to my mind is that if we give negative volition an inch, it'll take a mile. If we give negative volition an inch, it will find a way to take a mile. And so we always have to be careful of things. Always. Like it or not, we always do. My job is to be the bearer of that news. (laughs) But living obedient lives is never cost-free in this life. Living obedient lives to Christ is never uh, cost-free. When we had our song, The Banner of the Cross, it's a blood-stained banner. And it has been uh, since the gospel was first presented in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 15. And it has been that way. And it is not always an easy path. It is not an easy path to take. And the place in the ministry and in the pulpit is not a place and the place for any good Christian witness. It's not a place at ease in Zion. It's a place to do the work of the Lord, regardless of what it takes. And so we try to learn and try to apply what we know. We have an enemy that wants the Word of God to be stifled. And uh, I'll bring that out here in a couple of weeks in Ephesians. But in Genesis chapter 1, verses 3 through 5, the Lord said, let there be light, and there was light. All at that time was pitch dark on the earth. Then God said, let there be light. The Holy Spirit was at work brooding over the frozen deep. We do not know how long. We cannot say how long. There are some who make Genesis 1, 1 through 131, six literal days. From 1, 1 through 1, 5 to them is the first day. They believe that that is the first day. I do not. But let's look at what I believe is the restoration of the cursed earth. And I have said and taught why I believe the earth was cursed due to his first inhabitants, which is Lucifer and the angels. But they sinned. God judged them and judged that habitation, which was the earth. And then it became Frozen ice ball, ice pack, at least down to the surface. But then God began a movement of restoration like He does in turning a cold heart toward the Lord. The Spirit of God moves upon the face of the heart and He moves upon the face of this terrestrial uh, earth and the water. So the first point on your little handouts there, if you didn't get them, there's some there at the lobby on the PowerPoint handout, since we don't have our microphone for the remote left back, I can't use the other part of the building. So we're in here in the main auditorium for these lessons until I get my mic back for these lessons. But the first point we have is that uh, God commanded light to come on to the restoration of the cursed, cold, dark earth. God commanded that. He commanded light to come on to to the restoration to the earth that was in the process of being restored by the movement of the Spirit of God on the face of the earth and the face of the deep. The Spirit of God at the time when God called light to come upon the earth, the Spirit of God was already at work moving over the earth at this time in a supernatural way. And as I said last time, All three parts of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, have equal ability. Have equal ability. Not one is any less than the other. That would mean that there is lesser within the Trinity. There is not. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit are all equal deity. All equal God represented in that triune matter or manner.
And so the Holy Spirit could have spoken the Son into existence as well as the Son or the Father. The Holy Spirit could have been the one that breathed life into Adam as well as the Son. No difference. When you got saved, you got as much of God as there is to indwell you. So there is no excuse for pity pot Christians. No excuse for ignorant Christians. The Holy Spirit is not ignorant. <laughs> and if we're ignorant as Christians, it is only because we're not learning the Word of God. And so I'm not a real sentimentalist when it comes to that. Being prior military, as some of you others are, when it's time to do your thing, you have to know your stuff. You know, the Bible does not say for how long the brooding or thawing event went on. And to say you do know is called eisegesis, not exegesis. Eisegesis is reading into a text. The second point you have is that God had spoken the Son into existence untold years early in the original creation before Lucifer fell. So when God said, let there be light, this was not when He created the Son. It had already been created. But because of the judgment, the thickness of the firmament would not let any light come in. And no solar heat came in either. That was part of the firmament that God eventually lifted. And that was so thick and so dark that no light could penetrate it. This earth had its, its, its judge state and it had the atmospheric state was so thick with judgment. Remember the earth that the Lord made dark when Jesus was on the cross from noon till three on his day of the crucifixion over the entire earth for three hours. Not just an eclipse there in Galilee, but the entire earth was dark because of the sign of God's judgment upon the earth during that time. And at 3 p.m., the Lord let the light back in. And when Jesus says to Telestai, it is finished, God let the light back in for three hours. But now this was a lot more than three hours. He didn't hold the heat out at that time, but he kept the light out. In this case, God kept the light and the heat out. But the light had already been created when God originally created the heavens and the earth. God spoke the sun into existence well before Genesis chapter 1 and verse 3. God had spoken the sun into existence untold years earlier during the time of Lucifer having his dominion and being honored to live on a beautiful, pristine earth. The full revealing of the sun, seeing the sun on the restored earth, does not occur until the fourth literal 24-hour day. There's where you'll see the full lifting of the veil, the full lifting of the judgment of firmament. There's where you'll see the full sun when you see it. You'll say that it's a dark day, I don't see the sun, but I know it's out because there's, there's some light, there's light here. But it's a very dark day, thick clouds. Even on the darkest, cloudiest days, you still have enough light to see your hand in front of your face. You still got heat. And here's what we're looking at in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 3, which includes also the days of the vegetation coming into being before the sun is fully shown. The full revealing of the sun, seeing the sun on the restored earth, does not occur until the fourth literal 24-hour day. The light God called for on that first day of restoration, verse 3, was cloaked in a judgment of darkness, but now allowed to penetrate that darkness. The Holy Spirit thawed the earth. Chapter 2b. Chapter 1, verse 2, the second part. The Spirit of God moved upon the face or brooded, as it were, a hen over her eggs, thawing or warming them for life. So the Holy Spirit thawed the earth, not the sun. It was the Holy Spirit doing that, not the sun. God saw the light as good. All darkness was not yet gone, though. God divided the darkness from the light. The earth was still rotating on its axis as light was penetrating the thick cloud shroud of the thawing earth. 
God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, and it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness He called night, and the evening and the morning were the first day. So the Holy Spirit thawed the earth, not the sun. God saw the light as good. The light came through as it was good upon the earth. All darkness was not yet gone, though. But the sun was coming through that firmament that it held out its rays and its heat. Day two. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters. Midst of the waters. Yes, because the waters in the upper atmosphere and the waters upon the terrestrial terrain and the earth were all the same. They were together. When we have clouds, we say, oh, look at those big, thick thunder clouds. Look at all those clouds. They were on the earth. They were on the earth. Have you ever flown in an airplane through a dark storm? I don't mean the light fluffy ones where you get your camera and take a picture out the window. I mean a dark storm. It's a lot different. That's nice when you get on the upper side of it. But when you're in the dark storm, or at nighttime, of course, that's obvious. It's going to be dark. You're going to be looking for landmarks that are like, Whatever that you say, oh, I know what that is. That's such and such. How do you know you're at 35,000 feet? Usually you don't see them until you get down to about 15. But anyway. And God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. Water on earth versus water in the sky. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. And it was so. And God called the firmament heaven. And the evening and the morning were the second day. The firmament is the space between the earth and the upper atmosphere. Look at chapter 1 and verse 20. God said, Let the waters bring forth abundantly the moving creature that hath life and the fowl that may fly above the earth in the open, open firmament of the, of heaven. Or in, you know, there's three heavens. There's the heaven on the earth. There's the starry heaven and then the third heaven, which is the throne of God. This referring to the heaven around the earth. So the firmament is the space between the earth and the upper atmosphere. And God made the firmament and divided the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above it. And it was so when God called the firmament our upper atmosphere or the or heaven. This is not the starry heaven or the throne of God. It's the place where the birds fly as per chapter 1 and verse 20. And the evening and the morning were the second day. The water on the face of the earth broke away in part as the vapor lifted into the sky further. God opened the sky of Isaiah 40 and verse 22. At that time, thick clouds clung to the surface of the earth so densely that all light was blocked out. And then God began thinning out. And this is day by day now. God began thinning out the clouds and making a line of demarcation between the lower heavens and the face of the earth. Often when we leave here to go somewhere, probably, probably because we're not too far from Catawba Creek, it is foggy and thick as it can be here sometimes. And by the time you get to a higher elevation past the little town of Fincastle, just north I mean, south of here, it's just like you just drove into another world. You've done that before. You've driven into it and you've driven out of it. It's always more fun driving out of it than into it. You don't know what kind of cray crays in there. But you drive out of it. There's a lifting, but there's a firmament. But now imagine that being turned this way. The firmament is here and here, not here and here. God began thinning out the clouds and making a line of demarcation between the lower heavens and the face of the earth. The space there, lights in there. Atmospheric water now separated from terrestrial waters. Water in the atmosphere and water on the surface of the earth. Whether in the form of vapor, clouds, what have you, separated. Remember that up to the time of Noah, the earth received its moisture from heavy dew as seen in the Garden of Eden, as per Genesis chapter 2, verses 5 through 6 and verse 10. Genesis 2, 5 says, 
and every plant of the field before it was the earth, and every plant of the field before it was in the earth, and every herb of the field before it grew, and the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was not a man to till the ground. And verse 10 says, And the river went out of Eden to water the garden. From thence it was parted and became four heads. So there was rivers running, and there was this moisture and dew that came up from the rivers, and the mist uh, was enough to keep the earth saturated and hydrated and not overly baked by the sun. This went on up until the time of Noah. They had never seen rain. And as we read in Hebrews chapter 11, the Lord said, Noah, you're going to see things of which you have never seen before. And the covenant between Noah and God was the uh, rainbow covenant. God says, when you see the rainbow, it will prove to you that I won't once again flood the entire earth and destroy mankind as I did before. But prior to that time, They didn't have all these horrible storms and all this stuff that we see. They didn't have all these highs and lows like we see. That's the way the earth was. That type of a atmosphere, almost a biosphere, created a stable climate where even more animal life flourished flourished prior to the flood. This stable climate would mitigate high and low pressure systems that produce these horrible storms that bring heavy rain and heavy raindrops. Raindrops must be sizable enough to cause a rainbow, and up to this time that was not the case, and thus the new phenomenon of the rainbow covenant God made with Noah and his descendants was very special. Noah had been warned, as recorded later in Hebrews 11:7, of things not yet seen which he would see, so he got busy building the ark which saved his family along with the animals of that period that God wanted saving. Not all of them were saved, but God had animals of that period that he wanted saving. All others perished as per Genesis 7, verses 21 through 23. All the others perished, including all mankind, except for Noah, his wife, his their three sons, and their three wives. Total of eight. Total of eight. So in day two, and God said, let there be a firmament in the midst of the waters and let it divide the waters from the waters. And God made the firmament and divide the waters which were under the firmament from the waters which were above the firmament. So we got dividing of that firmament, that thick firmament between heaven and earth now that was there, left over from that cursed period of time. That's important for us to understand that. So getting back to Genesis 1, 6 through 8, where the division between thick cloud cover and earthly water was separated, we note the plan of God for moisture on the earth of which he was restoring. God was planning on having the earth moisture of being at a content level that life would grow and life would be possible. So we get to day three. Day three. Verse 9 through 13, day 3. And God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together unto one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called He seas. Now the word ocean is not in uh, the Bible. Now some people put it in their, in their translation, but the word ocean is not in the Bible. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters called He seas. And God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth vegetation or herbs. Let it bring forth grass. Some say vegetation there. The herb yielding seed and the fruit tree yielding fruit after its kind. You know, the seed is in the fruit whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. Now, this was the third day. Remember, there's some sun coming through just fine. There's a moisture content on the earth. There's been a dividing between the heavenly waters and the bottom waters. It's still thick, but it's there. And God said, let the earth bring forth herb, uh, grass, the herb, yielding seed, the fruit tree, yielding fruit after its kind, whose seed is in itself upon the earth. And it was so. And the earth brought forth grass and herb yielding seed after its kind and the tree yielding fruit whose seed was in itself. After its kind. 
And God saw that it was good, and the evening and the morning were the third day. God said, let the waters under the heaven be gathered together unto one place. Look at verse 9. Let the waters under the heaven be gathered together. Now he's talking about water on the earth. The word here, gathered, is the Hebrew word kawa. Q-A-W-A-H. Q-A-W-A-H. And it's taken from a root word meaning to be twisted into a strong rope. And it signified the strong boundaries that God would put around the waters, which is the sand or the seashore. So the oceans were brought into being with air purifying salt water at that time, which covers presently, as it did then, 71% of the earth's surface. Psalm 104, verses 6 through 10. So God caused eruptions on the earth's surface to create deep trenches where the water would settle. Proverbs 8, 17 through 29. God made the high places and the low places. Proverbs 8, 17. Proverbs 8, 17 says, I love those who love me and those who seek me early will find me. He's talking about the divine wisdom of God, the word of God. Riches and honor are with me, yea, durable riches and righteousness. My fruit is better than gold, yea, than fine fruit, and my revenue than choice silver. I lead in the way of righteousness in the midst of paths of justice. That I may cause those who love me to inherit substance, I will fill their treasuries. The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his way before his works of old. I was set up from everlasting from the beginning, or even the earth was. When there were no depths, now talking about the original early earth. When there were no depths, I was brought forth. Even when there were no fountains abounding with water. Before the mountains were settled, before the hills was I brought forth. While as yet he had not made the earth, nor the fields, nor the highest part of the dust of the world. When he prepared the heavens, I was there. When he set a compass upon the face of the depth. When he established the clouds above, when he strengthened the fountains of the deep, when he gave to the sea its decree that the water should not pass his order or commandment, when he appointed the foundations of the earth, he said the wisdom of God was there. As this third day event took place, God rose up the land mass even to create the high mountains in this one day. The oceans and the lakes and the streams were each connected in this rope. God called the dry land earth and to gather together the waters he called the seas and God thought, said that it was good. Also on the third day, God let the earth bring forth, sprout grass and vegetation. The Hebrew word desh, D-E-S-H-E. And this means herb yielding seed and the fruit trees bearing fruit after their men or their kind. In other words, their seed is within them. And it was so. This is the first mention of the word kind. It's a Hebrew word, M-I-N, and it means in its own species, genus, and family order. The sprouting of the trees and the flowers and the herbs on the third day were for the feeding of the animals which would soon come on the fifth day. And so the sprouting of the trees and the flowers and the herbs on this restoration of this earth were for feeding animals and mankind soon to come. And with those species, God installed in their seed their own makeup with potential for mutations within the original to diverse offspring of the same kind. No evolution or transmutations is a possible in this account of the Scripture. In other words, an oak tree is not going to make an apple no more than a dog is going to make a cat. They are species with their own seed, kind, variation, genus, phylum. They are free within that species to expand and to grow and to become something else, but they will still be within their species. That's not transmutation, though it is often called microevolution within a species. In other words, development 
which God ordained. But this is all six 24-hour days in regards to this teaching. So, there is cross-breeding within a species, but not outside of the species. Proteins will not connect to the DNA of the other. On this thawed water land separated, earth touched by light through thick cloud cover, on the third day, God said, let there be plant life. And made it in its own kind or species. And it was so, meaning it happened immediately and perfectly. It did not have to be developed. By the sovereign will of God, this is your fourth point on your third third page. By the sovereign will of God and the omnipotent power of God, He created out of nothing a complete plant system worldwide with grasses and trees and fruits and vegetables, all fully capable of re- reproducing its own kind in perpetuity. Enough sun came through the firmament to provide the heat and the light for plants to live before the sun became fully visible. And though the sun had been created in eternity past, this, just this side of eternity past in the original creation, it wasn't created in eternity past, but it was created before the fall of Lucifer. It was shrouded because of the, the judgment that God had upon the earth. And the thickness of the firmament was so much that it blocked out all heat, all light. The earth became an ice pack. The Spirit of God moved and thawed the earth. And then in six literal days, we have the restoration seen in Genesis' account here. Enough sun came through the firmament, and God divided the firmament, the thickness upon the earth and into the, our upper atmosphere, not the stratosphere, but the atmosphere. I don't think there's clouds in the stratosphere. But enough sunlight came through the firmament to provide heat and light for plants to live before the sun became fully visible on the fourth day. And so we'll look at the fourth, fifth, and sixth day, uh, Lord willing, on Wednesday. So I hope you can make it for that. But anyway, you've got some notes there and something to chew on. And uh, again, this is the eighth lesson in this series, so there are things to... Uh, to learn and to go on uh, for your edification. But anyway, we'll continue to study. We've got answers to give. We want to have biblical answers. We should not have to keep on as Christians searching the world for God's answers when many of them are right here in the Bible. And then some of it, yes, does require faith, like in the beginning, God. Or in eternity past, God, as the Hebrew language tells us. God was. So let's uh, go to Lord in prayer, and then we'll close up for this this period of study, and then we'll get ready for the 11 o'clock service. Father, we thank you for this day and for the many blessings that you give to us. We thank you for the kindness that you show us. We thank you that the mercy that you show us is real. It's genuine. It's based upon your righteousness and your satisfied justice. We thank you that you are a caring, loving God. You're not a a cosmic uh, ogre but a caring, loving God. And we thank you that you look out for us, that you care for us. And so we ask that as we lift up our, our word today in, in, uh, in preaching and in music, that you will be glorified, that you will receive the glory that you deserve, and that we will be edified in the faith and inspired as well. Thank you again for this day of grace. In Jesus Christ's name we do pray and give thanks.